Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Hello, this is Gary here, and this is the Kiwi Mana Buzz. We're a beekeeping podcast from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. And our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, and political issues about environmental problems. And we've been known to go off on tangents about other issues. And we also interview extraordinary beekeepers from around the world. And this week we have a guy called Michael Jordan, who's known as the Bee Whisperer in Wyoming in America. And this is episode 77 of our beekeeping podcast. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz bz slash Jordan. And here's some things you'll discover. You'll discover why Michael put cell phones into beehives and how he makes his mead consistent every year and what Michael feeds his bees over winter. And also, why do monks and abbeys hum? You'll find these and more soon just a quick reminder about guys it's pot it's international podcast day coming up on the 30th of september so if you haven't sent in your if you haven't sent in your little message which we discussed in our last podcast that'd be great if you could do that just send a a, a sound file and saying your name and what your favorite podcast is and also we've got a new feature on the on the kiwimana.co.nz website. You can actually click on send voicemail on the right hand side. And if your computer's got a little microphone or a little headset, you can actually record it straight on the site. So give that a go and we're just keen to see if that actually works. And it'd be good to hear from you guys and it'd be fantastic to hear your voices on the next podcast. And I can see that we can use this new feature to for you guys to ask questions as well. So we can play your questions and then answer them. So sit back and listen to Michael Jordan. Yeah, welcome everyone. I've got today I've got Michael Jordan, an holistic beekeeper from Cheyenne, Wyoming, who along with teaching beekeeping and making the famous King's Mead, is the Bee Whisperer. So welcome Michael, how are you going today? Oh, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me on. I know it's uh, very early in the morning where you're at, so I appreciate you slipping on some slippers and pouring a good cup of coffee to talk to to me today. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem at all. It's good to have you on the show. But given the audience a little overview, but tell us who you are and, and what you do. Well, I uh, write educational programs on beekeeping for kids, and I've wrote a couple programs that have been developed throughout uh, Ethiopia and Indonesia to develop beekeeping for orphanages so they can make a product and pollinate their food. And I've uh, helped donate beehives to Louisiana and the United States after Katrina to help reestablish the bees after they had that terrible storm that went through there. And I got picked up by the Discovery Channel because I was putting cell phones in beehives to see why people were telling me it's got to be the cell phone while we're losing bees. And I don't, I don't, I'm not a person that doesn't believe that everything that you hear. So I decided to put some cell phones in the beehive, and I just found out it's just like you. You sleep by a train station. You get used to it after a while. So I've just been traveling around and educating on the things that I've known about bees, and I've I've been all over learning about bees from different aspects from Europe and Turkey, India, and just learned different ways of keeping bees on a more natural basis than on putting them in a box and pumping corn sugar to them for them to survive. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's fantastic. And is that is that the edge um, method of education you're talking about? Yeah, I teach edge method of education. That uh, We're writing a program right now that we're filming for a farm in West Virginia called Perma Ethos. And the program's called a BDC course. It's a, a design course. So you take these modules. They have... Oh, 30 modules with about 100 lessons, and you establish a system of beekeeping. You know, it's uh, the educational part is you working with it, that we'll sit down with you, we educate you on everything from how to find the laws, and then we demonstrate how you apply those laws, and then you put them in a book. And then we teach you how to do queen, queen rearing, then we demonstrate how to do it, the different methods, and then you do it, and then you write how that worked for you, the, the parts that worked the best for you. 
you might be a miller cleaning person or you might be doing uh, cups and plastic uh, frames. It, it just depends if you're grafting or you're doing a more natural method. And you find out what kind of beekeeper you are by using the edge method. Yeah, it's educate, demonstrate, go for it, and evaluate. And with all the stuff I just said, that we educate you on all these topics, we'll demonstrate how we use them, and then we let you go for it, and then we evaluate the process of what worked best for you. So that way, you, you know, I'm not, a beekeeper is different from all over the world. And the closer you get to the Mediterranean, and the more you have to worry about swarm control because you'll have mass population. The more you get up to where I am, where we have almost like five to six months of death where we have no nectar, we have to manage bees different. And we have to find out what kind of beekeeper you are and develop a system for you because you can watch YouTube and you can read all kinds of books. If you're not using techniques that work for you in your area, you're going to fail in some things. Not everything works everywhere around the world. Absolutely. I mean, all beekeeping is local, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's there's, you know, the basic beekeeping concepts. You know, you have to find them and put them in a hive. You have to find a good colony. But, you know, what kind of hive are you going to use? Are you going top bar? There's several different kinds of top bar. Are you going lying strip? Well, there's the Langstroth style, but there's several different kinds of boxes of Langstroth from the rose method to the uh, Japanese deep box. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many different types of hives. And then, when you, then you talk about bees, what bees work best in your area if you're using a more rugged winter bee as a, a Russian or a hygienic bee. Are you trying to adapt... Uh, Maybe requeen an Africanized hive to see if you can make it more docile and more productive. But there's so many different aspects in every concept. It's not putting the box down and putting the bees in the box anymore. It's, it's very scientific, and it's a part of animal husbandry and working with nature to feed them. It's, it's a whole system. Yeah, absolutely. It, it must be really rewarding teaching the um, young kids about beekeeping and, and you know and seeing their eyes light up. Hey, eh? it must be great. <laughs> I think the funnest part is the observation high because they can get really close and they're almost scared, but they know that those bees are enclosed in that box. And, and so, how did you get started on beekeeping, Michael? I I worked for the Army Corps of Engineers as a private contractor, and I traveled around the world, and I I was always fascinated by bees, and everywhere I would go. I try to find bee farms and I'd try to look at beekeepers and see what they had. And uh, I, I came back to the States and was uh, going back through some things in my life and my grandfather died and I was reading a book about making a drink called King's Mead. And it was written in uh, Gaelic and some Hebrew and all, it had a whole bunch of different stuff written in it. And when I got it all deciphered, it talked about making uh, a liquor from honey, one of the oldest drinks known to man, and how they fought wars for it, and how these bees were shipped all over to make it. And it drove me. We made mead. It was very good. People enjoyed it. So I decided, you know, instead of buying honey and not knowing where it came from, we got bees, and we made tremendous investments and lost a lot of money. Mm. I was losing bees. I didn't understand things about feeding them. I didn't understand about winterizing bees. I didn't realize some bees weren't really flourishing in my area. I wasn't, you know, I was losing bees tremendously by swarming because I was just checking them every every two weeks, like the I was reading. And you know, you need to check them more regularly than that. They make queens in fifteen days, and in two weeks, you you might have missed it. Yeah, but I was, was missing. I lost them in the wintertime because I didn't realize about room and space that where I was from, they need more comb and more natural honey to make it through the winters. And I mean, it was just a terrible loss for me. And then once I realized that I met a gentleman who says, you know, you have to look at the history where bees come from and all the way to where you are. So I started looking back in the history of bees and, how they got to the United States and how they got from the United States to where I was and ended up meeting 
the gentleman's family, the Huffs that were, you know, they they can almost date themselves back to being, you know, like King Henry VIII's beekeepers. And they, you know, they've been generations here in the United States. And, and I found the beekeeper that was right here in Wyoming that mentored me. His name was Jack State. So I found everybody that was to right where I was where bees were working. And I started working that I needed three deep brood boxes. And these were the type of bees that worked the best. And this is a system of management. And the history of it, I really got into really working the bees heavily. And then since everybody was experiencing losses like Katrina, and I found out that you could make more sustainable businesses from beekeeping, making food, pollination, selling wax, selling honey. They're doing development with propolis around the world. We started writing programs to get kids to do it because Beekeepers are family businesses, and the kids aren't living on the farm anymore. So we needed to get the kids to beekeeping. I just I kept on drifting farther and farther away from the mead making of being fun to it was more fun being outside working with the kids and and watching them getting stung for the first time and how their reaction was and how it wasn't as bad as they thought it was and how you meet you know how immediately you cared for it and it was a relief and. The next time they go out, they're so more confident and the bees aren't messing with them because they'll smell that fear pheromone and it's a it's a it's a whole dramatic experience and you know I have a, a you know, my kids work with the bees, they play with them in the backyard. It just amazes people, you know, when you have fifty beehives in a city's backyard and the kids are playing on swings and stuff around them. You know, it's it's we all work together. It's just fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's it's really great. You're getting you're getting your kids involved, eh? Yeah, no, it's great. And and how how's the um how's the mead making going? You still you still doing a lot of that, or is it is it sort of taking a back seat? Well, I I make mead all the time. That's that's my the thing that got me started. Yeah, I, I don't own a meadery myself. I'm I'm working to build the perfect mead hall, and the only way I could figure that out was to travel and see meads and so I make meads. I, I make a king's mead that's it's my favorite. I think it's the one that people like the most. It's it's around twenty three to twenty eight percent alcohol. It's a nice nice drink and but right now I I'm traveling to different meaderies around I've been invited and I've been trying meads from everything from a s'mores chocolate mead to roasted vanilla to Earl Grey tea that had a lemon honey taste. It was a fabulous mead that I've tried. Now I just take my mead and I compare it with other people and we talk meads at different meaderies that I get if I get if I get a chance to break away from teaching I, I try to stop in and taste the honey that they're producing and the meads they're making from and I I, oh, I just love how the every honey has the different flavor and it always gives even the same exact recipe to use a different honey, it can change everything in it to other things. It's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Because one thing about mead that would be interesting is every year the, your mead would taste slightly different, wouldn't it, because of the different um, sources of nectar? Oh, totally. That Some years, that you know, you might have a huge cotton production. Cotton has lots of sugar in it. It has it's a higher sugar content than, I think, even like maybe buckwheat. And it has a higher sugar content, but both of them have different colors, flavors, different textures, all different kinds of things. So it's it's just wonderful when you see the different kinds of uh, honeys that are available. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how do you buy by making the product consistent every year? Is that hard to do? I uh, you know uh, I think what you find a good a good source like if you put uh, your flowers in a a good lot, like if if you're doing clover and you find a good area where you can grow, grow that clover every year and you can bring your bees in at the same time every year to get that clover flow of honey, you can, you can get your mead basically almost the same. A lot of people are doing a wildflower base and they're buying their honey from big markets and they're trying to get everything they can on that measure. So they... 
bigger markets and bigger meads like that are tendency to uh, buy in bigger bulks. Uh, small meaderies, I think, are really fun local meaderies because their meads fluctuate. They have different recipes all the time. Instead of going to one big meadery where they might have their general and one seasonal, I think the different flavors of honey that come around. But it's, it is hard to get a constant one frame of honey all the same all the time because nectar is always different. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, and I, I know in New Zealand some of the bush plants only flower every two years. Yeah. What's the, there's a, I guess a plant that's growing in New Zealand right now that uh, honey's very, very popular right now that people are buying. Yeah, that'll be Manuka, probably. Manuka, yeah, that's, uh, I, I have people around where I'm from about Manuka honey. Like, like I have no idea that, you know, I, I, I don't even produce it. I wouldn't know how to get it even that I'm, I'm, I'm awestruck at the prices and stuff that people are going on the extreme to get it. So it must be very, very valuable and have very medicinal properties to it. Yeah, absolutely. It's got some really good stuff. I think it actually gets rid of the MSRA virus that she kills it. So yeah, it's very good. And we actually interviewed the guy that discovered the medicinal purposes of it. Oh. Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. They use it for burns and stuff like that. Yeah, that's amazing. I just, uh, the only thing I've really ever used honey for other than allergies is uh, burns. I had a severe burn on my hand at one time that it was really, really bad. And then uh, I dipped my whole hand in honey and ended up going to the doctor the next day. And he scrubbed it and he says, well, it's very clean. He says, uh, I don't know what you use, but it's already starting a good disinfectant. And I said, well, we dipped it in honey. And he goes, well, that is a great thing to, to use. He says, that seals everything off and it's already a fighting bacteria. So that was great and good thinking. But then it, it healed my hand up within a week by using honey and stuff. But that was about the best thing I've used honey for me, uh, medically. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic product. I mean, the thing, the thing is, the, it's, to the bees, it's everything. It's their food, it's their medicine, it's their life, isn't it? So, bound to have good benefits for humans as well, isn't it? Oh, totally. I, you know, I also think that if you're getting a good nectar flow, good nectar, if, you're, if you have honeybees and you're getting a good nectar flow, I believe that the venom from when they sting you is more potent. I think that when they're getting such a natural thing that they have so much more to protect in that beehive, that their venom actually does get more potent and they become more protective of their hives. That I think that the good natural flow gives them way more energy than pumping them full of corn sugar and cane sugar and stuff like that. Yeah, it amazes me that people give them corn sugar, eh? Or even, you know, even, even, oh, we, we try and avoid even giving them sugar. You know, unless you really have to. Yeah, I have a, I have such a tremendous winters here. We prep for them by making alternative foods for them by blending honey down with apple juice and stuff like that, so they get some more natural minerals and sugar content. Because when you have five months of where they're not getting food, if you didn't have a good nectar flow, they don't get a lot of food source. So you know. A good investment on beekeeping in the United States is five hundred dollars, and when you have a couple hundred hives, you really have to do some good management. Make sure that they have either good nectar flow, or you're giving them a good source of something alternative. Yeah, I'm not a big recommendation of corn sugar for anything. I I, I had trouble keeping my kids away from the corn flakes even because I think they're bad. Yeah, try and keep it natural, eh? As much as possible. The, uh, the object is to be sustainable. You know, you can take your honey and dehydrate it and then put it in a processor and turn it into powdered sugar. And, you know, and every time you're done working with your bees, take your flower shifter and you dust the powdered honey on them, you're giving them back their own honey. It makes them clean each other. It gave them a treat. And it's better for them than, you know, trying to pump chemicals in there to to make them clean each other and you're not dumping corn sugar or dumping, you know, powdered uh, cane sugar on them. You know, you can dehydrate your own honey for that kind of stuff. You can find apple trees, juice them down that has high sugar content, blend that with your honey 50-50, 
and then maybe add like if you have five gallons of that mixture, add a cup of molasses for it, and then that uh, melts up the mineral content for them, and feed that to them. It has good sugar content. You're feeding them back their own little bit of honey. They're getting some minerals and nutrients back that they're almost like a nectar flow they'd be getting from an apple tree. Oh, that's 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 interesting. I've never heard of that. So it's apple juice and honey together, is it? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, by mix down, you know, the honey's a product that I'm not, you have, you're stealing it. I don't care how many honey boxes you put on there. The, the bees are making it. They're, they planned on using it or they wouldn't have made it. So, you know, some of the honey that we take, we save as much as, as we can, but we sell it. And then when some people want it, sometimes that's a tell I don't have any, but, you know, we're using it for, for feed. So it's okay to go ahead and feed the bees back to the honey, you know, if you have to. You know, it's a plant that everybody wants, but, you know, you have to be sustainable. If you're going to keep the bees in a box, you're responsible for them. I think that mm. you have a, I think you have a responsibility that you're the one that took them from where they were at. You're the one that put them in there. You have a responsibility for them if you're going to, if you're going to be a beekeeper. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you, you're changing the natural world, aren't you, by putting them in a box anyway. Well, yeah, they're not supposed to be, you know, they're manageable 30 to 40 feet in the air. They like big open spaces, you know. They they like being towards the Mediterranean belt. Uh, they like a mass quantity of fruit. That's why you find them in tropical rainforests more. It's, uh, you know, when you pick them up and you're putting them in a box, you need to feed them and you need to get them propagating correctly and you need to build a management skill to make sure they're not getting sick. And you need to find ways to make feed them. Like, you know, you can make a chamomile tea mixture with the honey. That helps them with the nosema and dysentery. You don't have to pump a whole bunch of, you know, drugs to them to fix that stuff. But, you know, it's just like you, if you live in a house and you don't keep your house clean, you get sick. You're putting them in a box if you're not rotating the frames and helping them clean the bottom out from the wax cappings and stuff. You're you're as much of the problem as they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's been a there's been a recent it's instance in New Zealand about um, nosema and they're causing so like uh, CCD like symptoms. So that's interesting. So you use chamomile tea for your in yeah. Your that I, you know that if you I always try to make things in five gallon batches because two gallons. And two gallons is four, and then it's my medication that I add with it. So it's, I fill a, a five-gallon bucket halfway full with honey. I fill the other half of it with water, and I blend it with a paint mixture when it's warm and get the sugars to dissolve, and that's usually about four gallons of mixture. And then I go ahead and I take another gallon of water, and I make chamomile tea in big bulk. Or I'll add a little bit of nutmeg and cinnamon to it. Or I'll mix a little bit and not use water. I'll use apple juice because it's high in sugar but a good liquid. And I'll put like two or three cups of chamomile that's grounded down and dry and boil it like a tea and then add it to that sugar mixture, honey and water. And they're getting natural antibiotics just like for you. You know, chamomile and stuff helps you sleep, helps your stomach at night. You know, a little bit of, and I don't use any peppermints or anything in any of the mixtures because that's a suppressant. Those are natural ways to suppress bees instead of using smoke. Is, you know, you, you dip uh, peppermint on uh, cheesecloth and you lay it on top of your honey boxes that pushes the bees downwards. So you don't have to use smoke. There's more, there's more natural ways to do. You know, the monks and, uh, and the Egyptian slaves used to shave their heads and rub. Uh, frankincense and peppermint on their bald heads and stuff and then would take the ashes from the fire pits and rub them on their necks and chest. And that would, that would keep the bees from landing on them because it was a natural smell that they did not like. You know, you don't have, you know, you don't have to come out there and pump them full of corn sugar and dust them full of smoke and rob them of everything they've got. That's not what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be propagating them for a little sugar and to help us pollinate our food products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's interesting about the ash on the neck, eh? 
and you know, with some natural smoke, you're just rubbing the natural smoke and stuff on it. I knew that, you know, bees are pheromone oriented, so smells do a lot for them. And, you know, it's like colors and smells, you know, they're girls. Things that look pretty and smell good, they like. Things that don't look very nice and don't smell very good, they don't like. If you if you even take a, a fan and you turn a fan on to the highest setting and then slowly turn it down to low settings and you record that sound, you can infiltrate a beehive, and when they start getting really, really frustrated and making that high-pitched sound, you can turn that sound down by using your own sound frequencies and override their sound and vibration and calming them down by natural sound measures. Uh, the monks and abbeys used to hum, and that was one reason why they owned. It was, it was an overpowering vibration, and when you work with a whole bunch of people making that sound, it controls... It's the natural spirit of working with the bees. You're calm. They're calm. The vibration from all of us is the same. I mean, these are natural things. You know, when I've traveled, these are things that I've learned that you can do so many better, way cooler things with bees than, than you even see on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. You know, beekeeping is an ancient art and stuff. A lot of it's already been invented, isn't it? Oh, yes. And, you know, like I said, when we first started, I told you the science scientific art of beekeeping has changed. It's no longer sticking them in a box. It's choosing the type of box. It's not getting bees. It's finding more natural feral bees that are in your area. It's not about checking them every two weeks. It's proper management skills of using the rose method or the 211 method or there's more manageable things where you're inspecting more. We're learning about manipulating colonies to swarm by themselves, producing natural queens. We're learning to split those hives so they don't swarm. There's way more skills than putting them in a field and hopefully they produce honey. You know, we have 3D printed frames now that the bees just put nectar in them and they cap them, right? There's nothing natural or organic about it. And they just fill them up and they make them run and work. So it's, you know, there's way more thing. You know, we're artificially inseminating queens. There's there's a lot of things that we're doing now that are, some aren't really good. And some of them we're trying to develop and build better brood colonies from and more holistic, stronger bees. And so what, what do you recommend is the best hive for a beginner to start with? I think uh, somebody should start with a mentor program. I think you should, if you're going to start, you should go find somebody that works with bees and ask them how much of their time they're willing to invest on you. That you need to go find somebody that has them and see how hot it is in a bee suit, what it's like to get stung, uh, the time frames that you're going to go out and work with it because it's going to be a hot, sticky mess. And you should go see what it's really going to take before you spend any money on bees. That's, that's a good idea. A bee colony is going to cost you, you know, in the United States, $500. And you should have at least three of those hives so you can make them grow and breed and establish which ones are working hard and which ones, you know, you got to have a comparison chart and stuff. So there are other things like that we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so what's your funniest beekeeping experience, Michael? <laughs> I got two of them, and both of them are with my son. He, when I first uh, met my wife, she already had children, and they came over to my house, and he was about three, and he walked out in the backyard, and there was all the bees, and I could just hear my girlfriend at, at the time, now she's my wife, she just took a big gasp of air, because <sighs> he was right in the middle of the beehives, and he goes, what are these? And I said, well, those are beehives. And he put his eye right in the hole and was looking inside that beehive. And he pulled his head back, and the bees were calling all over his head. And he says, well, you can't see them in there. And, and you know, he wasn't afraid <laughs> or anything. They're just calling. He said, I said, no. I said, you know, I'll, I'll open up one one time. I'll let you see them all in there. You know, they're calling on his face. And he, <laughs> he didn't get stung, and it was just the most amazing thing that they didn't really mind him, and he didn't really mind them. 
that was a good learning experience for me when I get about kids and uh, how they can feel the love and honesty of people, and, and natural things can feel it too. Uh, yeah, that was a good yeah. learning experience. And then the next time, all of his friends were in the backyard. He's about five years old. And I've always told him, you know, we have the bees in the backyard. You guys got to be careful. We don't want anybody back in this part of the apiary because there's a lot of bees back there. You guys can play over here mostly. Well, the trash man heard all the kids playing, and he jumped up on the fence and started yelling at the kids. And my son goes, you're not supposed to be in their backyard. I guess the trash man basically said, or oh, what? And he picked up a stick and hit the, the beehive, and the bees chased this trash man about three blocks down the street. And I only found out because the sheriff showed up at my house asking about uh, me being able to train the bees to attack people. <laughs> Which I didn't know. I didn't know my son had that kind of communication skills, but I guess you, you know, if the boy tells you not to come in his backyard, you don't go in his backyard. So, so those I thought were, you know, those are, those are just. I just can't believe how innocent and how kids are. They're just so funny. The only thing that's ever really happened to me is I was doing my first swarm removal. I got underneath the tree, and the wind was blowing pretty heavily. And I didn't realize that they would just fall. And it fell down and into my shirt and down around my neck and all over my head. And out of the whole ordeal, I only got stung once. But it was very, very frightening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like uh, getting a swarm poured on your head, is it? Well, it's different when you're trying to do a bee beard or something, but yeah, it just fell right on, on top of me. And I'm going to go ahead and say my butt puckered, and I was trying to gasp for air because I thought it was over. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it it is amazing that kids have no no natural fear of bees, isn't it? So that's it's awesome. Yeah, that well, you know, as soon as they realize that it's you don't wave at them, you know, you don't don't wave at, at the bees because that's throwing your pheromone of fear at them. You know, that's waving all the stuff at them, so don't swat at them. And once they learn that the bees are going to bounce off of them to see if you're aggressive, it's almost like the the bully at the school tapping your shoulder, what are you going to do? Once they realize that if you're not swinging more pheromone at the bee and you're walking away, the bully walks away too. So such in life, if the bully keeps picking on you, if you just walk away, he finds go somebody else to pick on or he just leaves everybody alone because there's no fight. And that's the same with the bees. They just kind of realize, well, there's no fight here. We're pretty much good to go. So yeah, exactly. Once, once the kids feel that that's okay, you know, that the bees are going to come up and bounce at them and check them out and smell pheromone, it's okay. And then they're okay, and then, you know, they get to work with them a little bit more. You know, you always have to wear protective equipment, though. There's no ever, we, there's no getting around that ever. Yeah, I, I, I always wear at least a veil, eh? No, I, you know, I do a lot of things without it, but... And when it comes to kids and stuff, you know, you have to have EpiPens and you should have some training and you should always carry Benadryl with you or something. Because you never know. Like I said, you never know. You're dealing, it's a, beekeeping is the most extreme sport you'll ever do. Because at any moment, you, a uh, small insect can incapacitate you. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Absolutely. And so what, what sort of highs do you keep? Michael, is it all, all top bars? No, I keep a variety of different hives. Uh, I have a, a top bar hive or two. One's called a tabletop hive, and it's a modification made at, uh, with Langstrip frames using a Kenya system so that the, the frames are all put together. I use a barrel hive, and uh, it's, it's, it makes all the comb round. It's like a 15-inch tube, so all the frames are round. And then oh, I, use, I think I've and seen I, those, yeah. And then I use Langstroth style of beekeeping uh, for most of my commercial and uh, education because they're easy to tear apart and you can go through them faster. I keep uh, I can keep up the... I'm registered and licensed to keep up the 50 beehives at my house. And I have several locations throughout Wyoming and the Colorado area of, of the United States that I keep bees. And we keep up to about 150 hives. And because you live in quite an urban area as well, don't you? Yeah, I do. I, I do. Uh, 
I live at 12 blocks from the state capitol in Wyoming, and I keep bees in the inner city. Do you have any issues with neighbors or anything? No. Uh, actually, I'm not even supposed to have chickens in my backyard, and I have chickens, so my neighbors really like me. When you're feeding your neighbors milk and honey, they they pretty much don't, don't mind you. Well, that's the one thing I loved when I learned about permaculture is that the more food that I was growing, the more food people ate, and the more that they stopped stealing from me, the more they came to, came to work. But uh, I had food growing <laughs> along the side of the road, and I had the zoning officer who says, you know, what are you growing here? And I said, they're, they're going to be cucumbers and squash. And he goes, well, people come by and pick them. I said, well, good. He said, well, at least it's getting <laughs> used, and I know they're getting good food. And then he doesn't stop by anymore because he realizes I don't care. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's a good attitude. And so what what excites you, Michael, about the beekeeping? I think the most exciting thing about beekeeping is developments of new things and how people are learning not to think inside the bee box. That you have the high uh, the flow hive that people are coming out with. You have the new sun hive development that is a basket weaved beekeeping system. You have people that are breeding different kinds of bees and making hygienic bees with uh, strategic names to do certain stuff. I, I think the scientific development excites me when people come up to me and tell me, have you ever seen this type of watering system? No, I've never seen it. I've never heard of it. I'd like to. Show me pictures. I, I think that's exciting when somebody comes up to you with a whole new concept that uh, you've never seen before and is thinking outside that bee box. That's a, that makes you want to go out and try something just to see if it works. Uh, they're trying new earth for, uh, floors, but they're putting a box that has debris and stuff in it, hoping that the uh, melocyanin from fungus and stuff helps push the mites and kill beetles by making more hygienic bees with earth bottom floors. And, uh, Paul Stamos has a beehive made out of uh, uh, mushrooms that are making the bees healthier to fight mites. I mean, there's just, I mean, a beehive made out of a mushroom is just incredible in, in general, but using it for scientific measures to fight things, that's crazy. That's great stuff. Yeah, that's interesting work he's doing. Eh? Well, well, hopefully you can make that a commercial product, eh? Oh, I, I think he's doing phenomenal work. He is reaching new levels in beekeeping, fundamental fighting by, uh, pests and bacteria on a natural level that we should be doing anyway. He, he's doing fascinating work. I, I heard him at Permaculture Voices. A uh, gentleman recorded some things for me. I read some of his stuff. He's doing phenomenal work. Yeah, no, it's great. I've, 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 he's got a video out there on YouTube. We'll have to include that in the show notes. Some it's an interesting interesting research he's doing. Yeah, he's doing great stuff. There's you know, there's uh you know and you know the, the, there's gentlemen there from Australia that made that flow hive. I think that that's a very interesting concept. I think that would be really cool. I think that would be cool at a restaurant where people would be sitting indoors and they're looking out the window and they see all the bees and somebody comes up and opens it and the honey comes out and stuff. But I think that's very interesting. I think that would be a good thing to get people interested in beekeeping. I don't know how good it is for the bees because there's there's nothing natural in it. It's all plastic, and the bees aren't really working other than filling it. You know, it's a it's almost an industrialization of what they do. But the concept of thinking how to produce frames already to make honey is uh, that's. That's a phenomenal idea. That's thinking completely out of the realm. Yeah, it's interesting, eh? Because I've actually seen the way they do it, and, and they actually like extract the honey from the back of the cell, and the front of the cell stays intact. So I'm just wondering if the bees realise the honey's gone. You know, I I don't know. I there I have so many questions about it. Uh, I just know I I'll be honest. I don't think I'll spend the three hundred dollars to buy one. But I just, I, I, do, I have a lot of questions about it that I. I think the technology could be used to do many other things on quick brood rearing for times when uh, you had a queen that wasn't, that you could put in already pre-made foundation with a new queen to do 
big, large population growth. I think that you can use the foundations now with black to actually see the white lever production for grafting better. I mean, I see some concepts that are that can grow from it. You know, it's just that, it's just like the atom bomb, though. That is, you know, you split an atom, one man sees the potential of giving everybody free energy, and another man splits the atom, and he goes, "I'm taking over a country because I have the power to do it." You know, I, I think I think by using a flow hive, if you knew what you were really doing and you were pumping sugar to it. The bees, like you said, don't really know the honey's ever missing, and they'll just produce hundreds and hundreds of pounds of honey that's not natural. Uh, you could pump corn sugar to them, and they could just fill those up. You could dump them out, and you could go on an industrial level that could be incredible. But, what, you know, like I said, it's all in the hands of the user. You know, if you choose to pump corn sugar and stuff, are you a bad beekeeper? If you do it excessively, yes. Yes, you are. If you're doing it to vitalize them and to get them started or when times are really bad and you're just trying to help them? No, you're not. If you're not using corn sugar and you even go on further and you're using apple juice mixtures and stuff, you have to remember you're still keeping them in a box. They're not in a tree. They're not hanging in a cave. I think some of the most natural beekeepers are the guys that are doing frame outs on their porches and letting the bees just build huge comb hanging down off the porch. I think those are the most natural measures. Those are the most natural beekeepers. But, you know, you have to work the bees still, and it's hard to inspect the uh, mites, and it's hard to inspect uh, if they're cleaning the brood out. But, you know, they're open space, so the mites should be falling to the ground because there's no way to jump back up into the cone. Then if you're looking on the bottom and looking for dead larvae, you're doing more. So, I mean, there's, there's certain things you have to get going to be a beekeeper, you have to manage them. You're putting them in a box. You're, you have to manage them. Mm. Absolutely. And what do you think is the biggest mistake you see a lot of new beekeepers making today? I think the biggest one is they're, they're not getting a mentor. They're not going to hands-on training. I think a lot of them are getting in there, and they're not really, really realizing the difference between packages, nukes, colonization. They're not getting the glossary terminology and how to apply it. That they go, oh, I have a beehive in my yard. And you go, that's nice. They go, oh, can you come get it? No, that's called a swarm of bees. (laughs) You don't have a hive of them or you'd be managing them, sweetheart. There's, There's some, you know, the... As a beekeeper, you need to learn the difference between the brooding mechanism. You know, you have to learn to build your own nukes. You have to learn to populate. It's a form of animal husbandry, and that's the thing that the new beekeepers are getting is they're buying a package of bees. And they're learning that they have to feed them tremendous amounts of sugar, and they're not building the colonies that they want because, you know, the, those bees in packages are only, you know, they're already 15 days old before they get to people. They're already dying off. If the queen's not laying right away, they don't know how to manipulate. They're not getting the education. If you're a new beekeeper, you need to find your lives. You need to work with the beekeeper, and you need to find out what your budgets are going to be. Those are the three major things that I teach right off the bat. Let's find out if you can keep the bees with while I'm getting stung. And while you're getting stung, you should be working with that mentor to see how not to get stung. And you should be seeing what it's costing him and how it's going to cost you in the long run of your investment that you're going to be doing. Because taking classes costs money. Buying books costs money. A beekeeping suit costs money. You know, these are the three basic steps you should start looking at before you beekeep. Absolutely. I mean, even going along to, like, local clubs and stuff, eh, just to get your hands in a hive and see how it works. Yeah, I really recommend that as well. Yeah, it's one thing, oh, you tell people, oh, I'm not scared of bees, I've been stung. Hey, it's a whole different measure when you have about 500 of them bouncing off your head, climbing all over your hands, <laughs> in the front of your face, and you're dripping sweat into your eye, and you want to rub it, but you know those bees are between yeah, you, yeah. and you know there's, it's a whole different measure than getting stung and then working with those bees. <laughs> Yeah, when you've got like seven or eight bees flying inside your veil, hitting your eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's how'd they get in here? Oh my gosh, I've got to run. 
<laughs> Exit stays left. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's 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 totally different. Eh? You get, you get one one B is nothing, and you get like five hundred on your head. It's it's a different experience. Yeah, it's a whole different thing. And there's you know bees will tag you. They'll bounce that stinger off you to let you know they're there, but they don't sting mm. you. You know when they sting you, it's a difference of you know you know having a toothpick jam. You know you're you know touching a toothpick in and then stepping on a nail. But right, there's, you know, getting stung is a whole different measure if they're going to pull their stinger out and sting you. It's a, it's a different feeling. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Michael, if you could travel back in time before you had bees, what, what's one thing you would tell your, your young self? Oh, uh, why would anybody do it? And why am I fascinated watching it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess I couldn't understand why I was fascinated in seeing uh, the little insects and then I just watching the people and how they, in some places they just drape themselves in white cloth. The, the beekeeping is different everywhere. And I think just watching it, I grew up in an area where we grew cattle and you all, everything was almost always the same. And here I was going to watching beekeepers and everything was always different every time. Some yeah. people pull their frames out differently. Some people inspect things differently. Uh, some people are uh, in the German pipe smokers, man, where they're just blowing the smoke from the pipes and they keep them in their mouths and have their hands free the whole time. You know, there was a reason for it. They could use their hands. And you go to the Eastern and European and over here in America, it's the, the pumping action of a bellow smoker, right? So just seeing the different kinds, watching the people use incense, instead of smoke, so they get good smells and can control the smoke more. Uh, there's just so many different styles. I think that when I was watching and watching the people work the bees, how they were just at peace working with them, and it was always different. Oh, you can get those veils with a little hole in the front where you can put your pipe through? Yeah, I, well, or, or they would, uh, you know, just a little frame thing, they'd stick it in their mouth. Some of them yeah. weren't even wearing veils. I think just a tremendous amount of tobacco smoke around the face and stuff all the time. Some of them weren't even wearing the veils. Most of them wearing were big, long arm gauntlets because their hands were deep inside these tubes and logs of, of bees. You know, over in, in Germany and stuff, you know, they still do log-bearing hives and stuff they don't have. In America, we have to have frames. We have to be able to pull frames for inspection and stuff like that so it, it's a whole different thing when you go to places that, with different laws different regulations and you know in india you have to work with in a beekeeping apprenticeship program before you can be the beekeeper so there's there's all kinds of stuff from all over yeah absolutely so what do you, what do you think's the biggest issue facing beekeeping in, in cheyenne at the moment uh, I, I think right now it's going to be the the lack of, of flowering flow that, that we should be having. We've had, we don't have a lot of crops that grow. People grow corn. We're monocroppers where I'm at. And I, I think that's a term. I think that's so bad. I think my, that's my biggest thing why I'm at is the monocropping. So do you bees have enough resources with all the, all the monocrops? Well, well, you have to move them. Right? If you're doing any type of beekeeping on a... Uh, you know, a backyard beekeeper has five to ten hives. A hobby beekeeper is looking to make a little income. So he might have 25 to 250 hives. A commercial beekeeper has anywhere from 150 hives to 1,000 beehives. And then the industrial beekeeper is the gentleman that has, you know, anywhere from 10,000 hives to 100,000 beehives. Different kettle of fish, isn't it? Is it you know, commercial versus urbans? Uh, well, you know, we we do, you know, in Wyoming we have a lot of commercial beekeeping. We have huge clover flow that we can put the bees hives in clover. But you're only feeding them clover. It's like taking all our bees in America to the almond fields. You know, we, we put you know, a million beehives in the almond fields to pollinate almonds. So they only get to eat almonds, 
And then all these beekeepers that we have, all these big hives, the next thing you know, they need to move those beehives to put them somewhere. So then they move them to places like Wyoming for clover or South Dakota for the sunflower field. So, so you get a lot of you get a lot of migratory beekeeping coming in there. Then? Yes, right. That the migrators come in for the different things, and if we if we would have more multi crops coming up at different times, some of the beekeepers wouldn't have to move their bees. It would just be flow for them all the time. It would be hard for the almond growers because now beekeepers wouldn't want to move their bees because. I'm getting just as much honey flow and there's just as much money from pollination where I'm at without moving them. That's my problem is that I have to plant a lot of products to produce different nectar flows for wildflower honey, which I prefer the most. Yeah. There's some good wildflower honey. So, you know, I'm, I'm planting as many seeds as I can. I'm in the inner city side of the, the botanical gardens and the city parks. So I get most of mine, but a gentleman that's not in the city that's keeping bees outside the country, he's got clover. That's the biggest crop that they grow. And, you know, there's not a lot of different flower products. There's not a lot of citrus products. So in our area, it is the honey flow and the nectar flow that's so hard for us. What do you do about pests in your area? Do you have any pests at all? The only problem that we usually would have would be wax moth. Uh, we don't have a lot of hive beetle here because it gets too cold. Uh, we don't have we don't have infiltration of Africanized bees because it's too cold. The biggest problem is maybe the mites, and that's from uh, transportation where other bees might be from mass pollination of monocropping. Uh, you we have very little American fowl brood. In fact, the Wyoming Beekeepers Association and Agriculture Forum hasn't had a report of American fowl brood. In, in 10 years, that as wow. soon as they started inspecting and re- making, you know, in Wyoming, you have to register your beehives for their location. And then if you have any problems, they'll send a state inspector out for free to help you manage your beehives. So we don't have a lot of pests here. The, you know, we have problem with death in winter, that if you don't get the bees wintered good and with lots of food, you lose them. So it's, yeah. it's the food source that we have in the harsh winters of wind. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've AFB here still got a problem, so we've actually found a case last week of it. So not not now, not now, April, but now one of our customers, April, it's still a major issue here. But that, that's fantastic. You haven't had it for ten years. It's really great, great news. Yeah, well, it's the inspection system that they're doing, and the Beekeepers Association makes it so you have to GPS locate your bees, and if you don't. They come right in, they see your bees, they investigate them and see them. And if, if the bees are not in good health, they, they destroy them. If they are in good health, they want to get them to a, manage, a beekeeper that manages them because they're agriculture. Mm-hmm. And if you want your bees back, then you have to go and work with that beekeeper and get your bees back. That way you're registered and they actually know that you're doing inspections, hive and frame rotations, and know what you're looking for for parasites. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic program, isn't it? That's really great. Sorry, and that's run by the state? Yeah, that's run by the state. Wyoming has a good program. It's very minimal. They don't like a lot of government control in the beekeeping. So they just want you to register them and follow the basic guidelines that they've precisioned. Like, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you need to have so many hives at each location, and you need to manage them at certain time frames. If you're a hobby beekeeper... Yeah. You need to make sure you don't get any more of those bees. That way, you know, you're not doing it, you know, because your management skills aren't going to be the same as a commercial beekeeper. But there's other states, you know, in the United States that have tremendous things. Like West Virginia has some great beekeeping, and they even offer introductory all the way to master beekeeping programs in West Virginia. And, and, you know, those are free. The inspector, uh, one of the inspectors I, I know personally, his name is Wade. He's he's there in West Virginia. He, he's been managing bees since he was a little kid. He works for the Department of Agriculture there. And he has 200 beehives and inspects bees all the time. He, he loves it so much that he can't get away from it. So those are programs developed in other states here that the beekeeping people are actually the inspectors helping each other. 
that's how we're doing better. We're helping each other without government control. That's awesome, isn't it? You know, all, all working together like the bees, eh? <laughs> but but less stinging, I hope, Michael. Yeah, stinging. <laughs> I, I, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the one part that I don't always like. <laughs> I, I just had to do that one for a, a video for the teaching program is getting stung, what it looks like, and how to remove it. So at least that part's done with the teaching program, and I don't have to do that again. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's, your, what's your plans for the coming season then? Well, I'm getting ready here to right now. As soon as we get off the phone, I'm walking into this meadery, and we're going to try some mead. And then I'm uh, getting back to my hometown, and I've got to start doing splits and nukes that I'm getting ready to teach, uh, do little splitting, some uh, Miller cleaning methods, and how to do some grass bars. I'm going to teach people how to start doing some cleaning. So my, my end of my year here is finishing up my teaching program and get back to where I like to be is outside and teaching the bees. If, if I can get bees going with everybody, I'll do good. Yeah, that's fantastic. Maybe maybe one day I'll have a meadery. Maybe I'll... I'll I'll settle down and just have my own metery. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can see it now, Michael. You're, you're, it's going to happen for you. Well, I hope so. I, you know, I started out, that's where my adventure started, and with traveling around the world and talking with beekeepers and meeting fantastic people, I, I'm still in that realm of drinking a fine drink of the gods, but being outside and watching young beaks and beekeepers work is is where it's at. Yeah, absolutely. Much joy, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Well, will you watch that uh, driving and the driving, drinking and driving the mead, man? Oh, I, I have. I have a designated man. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> we, want, we want. We want you to get home safely. Oh well, thank you very much. Good. And so, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? I, uh, you know, I, my, I have a, a website. It's abfriendlycompany.com. dot com. All one word: a b e e friendlycompany.com but most people reach me on Facebook that, that multimedia site where you can share videos and your film footage and ask questions and stuff but I love when people send me photos and videos of what they're doing I think that, that even anybody that's been doing it forever they think oh you know he's probably seen it you would not believe the things that I learned from watching people do different things it helps me teach and helps me learn Many different things from feeding styles to smoking and not smoking to, I mean, just uh, the Facebook site's a good way to find me. Is there, but yeah, I have a website and you can probably catch me on, uh, on a tour if you look at some local extensions and stuff. I'm trying to get down to your area to learn about some dwarf stinger bees that a gentleman's teaching. So I'm trying to get that way to learn about some, some little bitty bees in your area. Oh, they're the ones in Australia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. We'll. Um. Yeah. They're interesting, eh? And they even produce honey, don't they? Yeah, like the little ball, and you mash it, and you extract it, and they live in like a little shoebox, the size of a gnat. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating little bee. Absolutely. Yeah. No, they're interesting. Interesting people in Australia. <laughs> yeah. If you, <laughs> if you ever get down here, yeah, definitely come and see us, eh? Oh, I would love to. I. I would love to try to get down there as soon as I can. I, I got to meet Bill Molson's grandson, Stu, at Permaculture Voices, and just the work that they've done for permaculture and uh, just fabulous for humanitarian work is just awesome. It's awesome. That's great. Oh, well, thanks so much for coming on, Michael. It's been awesome talking to you. I you know, could have talked for another hour, but I'll uh, we'll have to... I, I, know you, I know you want to get into that uh, metery, so it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a great show, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. It's a lot of information there, so I'm probably going to have to listen to that again as well myself. There's some He's got some great tips there. I'm going to try that um, idea out about using the apple juice and the honey thing. I think that might be an interesting idea to try that. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening today, guys. It's fantastic to have you on, on board and have you supporting us. And if I can ask you to do one thing this month, it's just if you can go to iTunes, which is kiwimana.co.nz slash iTunes, and please leave a review on our show, and we'll read those reviews out on the next show, which will be episode 78, and that'll be out in a couple of weeks.
And the show notes for this interview with Michael Jordan is kiwi.bz slash Jordan. So thanks a lot, guys, for coming along, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.